right. So we've got pe- three people involved today, uh, and I'll briefly introduce them before handing over to our moderator. So our first speaker is John Ermish. Um, he's Emeritus Professor of Family Demography at Oxford University and a Senior Research Fellow at Nuffield College there. Uh, and he has a large number of publications on uh, various issues relating to demography, um, economic impacts of demography, family economics, that kind of thing. Uh, and he is also the editor in chief of the journal Population Studies. So um, then our second speaker joining us from Japan uh, is Haruka Sakamoto. Um, she is an associate professor at Tokyo Women's Medical University. And she's also a senior manager at the Health and Global Policy Institute. Um, and she has a direct experience as a primary care doctor. Um, she's also a researcher at uh, Tokyo University Graduate School of Medicine. Um, and she's got a lot of international experience, having got her MPH uh, at Harvard and having worked for a number of years in the International Cooperation Department of the Japanese Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare. So she was representing Japan at bodies including WHO, uh, the G7, and so on. And then our moderator today is Willem Adema, um, and he is a senior economist at the OECD's Social Policy Division. So he heads a team of researchers looking at issues relating to family, children, gender, and housing. Uh, They maintain a number of the OECD's key Uh, statistical databases on these issues, uh, and his team have published a variety of researches covering um, family and gender issues in uh, all sorts of different countries. And so at this point, I'm going to hand over to Willem. Um, You can see the timeline here. He's going to give us a brief introduction, and then we'll get on to the speakers and Q&A. So over to you, Willem. Right, let's unmute myself first. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Jason, for your introductory remarks. And I would very much like to uh, welcome all the participants. And I'm looking forward um, to a very uh, active, interactive uh, session this this afternoon um, in what is a fascinating um, uh, topic and area of research. in 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 the immediate aftermath uh, of 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 the Second World War, the life was relatively simple in terms of uh, the prevalence of of traditional gender roles, and a lot of families were um, male breadwinner households, and uh, there was a clear division of roles um, in terms of paid work and unpaid work uh, done at home, uh, often. Um, by by mother by women and mothers, fertility rates were were high, um, often in in the sixties above uh, two children um, per uh, per mother uh, per woman, and um, then uh, a downward trend started, as from from the sixties and seventies, and uh, fertility rates have now fallen in some countries to below one. Korea has a fertility rate of 0.8 uh, children per uh, woman. Uh, and uh, so it is quite understandable that in a lot of countries, not in all um, OECD countries, but in a lot of countries, there are uh, concerns about the fertility rate and the, fu- the future look of societies. Um, fertility rates are influenced by a range of factors. There's no one single um a uh, policy tool that you can use and uh, hey presto the fertility rate goes up or down um positive uh, associations between public investment in uh family benefits um services such as child care um and support for parental leave um have a positive effect on uh fertility trends um nowadays <clears throat> sorry contrast to the past uh, female employment also is positively uh, associated with with fertility trends uh, but negative impacts are uh, increasingly coming from the cost of housing uh, some countries uh, including korea and perhaps japan we will hear um on the, of the cost of uh, education uh but still there's a lot of uh, things we do not know 
about the drivers of fertility trends. So we hope to find out a little more today. And um, as Jason said, uh, John and Aruka are here uh, to talk us through this. Uh, John will go first because he will cover a range of countries and then Haruka will uh, address uh, the issues as specific to Japan. John, may I welcome you to the floor and, and um, start your presentation? Thank you very yeah. much. So I, yes, I, as, uh, as Willem said, I'm, I'll, I'll give you a bit of an overview and then focus in on some things that we might eventually talk about. So, uh, so next slide, please. So I, I'm going to use, to make sure we're clear, an indicator which is called the total fertility rate throughout. And this indicates the average number of children a woman would have if she were subject to the age-specific fertility rates in a given year. So it's defined for a given year, but it's it's in it's in in the measurement measured in easily understandable things with children per woman. And the first slide I'm going to show you highlights the similarity in movements in a large in a large number of countries in Northwest Europe and the Nordic countries. Uh, particularly the decline since 2010. So if we have the next slide, please. Next, please. So on the, uh, so the, there's the four, four main countries of Northwest Europe are on the sort of top of the slide because they have higher fertility. Uh, you can see that the solid red line is England and Wales, just to put that in perspective. And the dashed red line is Japan, which is on the bottom. Uh, and uh, you can see the movements in Northwest Europe are quite, are quite uh, similar. Um, well, what stands out is that in uh, rates are much lower in Southern Europe and in, uh, in Germany, uh, which more, more like the levels in Japan. Next slide. So as you can see, Japanese Fertility is much lower than in, in Northwest Europe and the Nordic countries, and has fluctuated much less over the past 30 years. As I just mentioned, they're, they're similar to Southern Europe, and they also have been in the past similar to German and Austrian fertility, but as but had a but German and Austrian fertility had a recovery since then and then a small decline. So I, I just want to highlight the similarities across Northwest Europe and Scandinavia which suggests that there's some common influences on the post-2010 decline in fertility at play. Next. And this just gives you a longer term perspective, which uh, compares England, Wales, Northwest Europe, excluding England, Wales, the Nordic countries and Japan. And you can see those European countries going back to the 1960s, particularly Northwest Europe, and England, Wales had very similar movements over this long period. And the Nordic countries uh, are, are not too different. And Japan stands out as, uh, as having a long-term decline and staying uh, well, well below 1.5. Next, please. So another thing to look at, are there differences by social groups? And I, I'm going to focus on England and Wales since I've done a lot of research on this. And I, I'm going to define the social groups in a sort of intergenerational way. So I'm going to define them by a combination of parents and own education. So in the slides that will follow, when it says high education for the parents' generation, I mean a qualification beyond secondary school. And for the their children's generation, I mean a degree or higher, because those, those were quite clear uh, differences between groups in those two generations. So the, the so next slide, please. So this shows the total fertility rate by this combination of uh, uh, parents and own education level. And you can see there's been declines in every group. Uh, some of the biggest, so the, gives to give you an idea what these slides mean. So the low low in the left-hand corner are those who over two generations had persistently low education. 
the low high are the upwardly mobile, the high low are the downwardly mobile, and the high high are the persistently high education across generations. And you can see the biggest fall actually was between those who were downwardly mobile. Their parents had a high education, the women themselves had a low education. But I mean, you know, it, it, the, the clear, the big takeaway is there's been declines in every group. Next, please. This this slide shows you the uh, the mean age at which, which people women had their children in by these same four groups. And again, you can see in every group the mean age has been increasing. Women are having uh, children later in their life. Uh, but there's, I mean, there are clear social, social distinctions. So even even though there's been increases in this mean age across all the groups, you can see that those in persistently low group have children even in the even in the latest years under 29. While on average, while in the high high group, they're nearly nearly 33. Next, please. So why might European TFRs be falling since 2010? So I'm, I'm going to outline four reasons. One, one is less unplanned fertility. Uh, look, in other words, a lower proportion of women are having more children than they wanted because of contraceptive failure. Well, I, I don't think you, yeah, you might think this is a complete thing in the past. It's still not, but it's still, I, I don't think it can explain that much of the de recent declines. The next, the next thing is what people really, I, what they ideally would or desire to have in terms of family. And answers to questions like, generally speaking, what do you think is the ideal number of children for a family? These answers to questions like these generally suggest that the, the ideal size is relatively stable in Europe with a convergence on the two child family and a mean family size just above two. And um, next slide shows the, uh, so next slide please, the pattern of expected family size, which is slightly different, but what it asks, the, I, these are responses from women when they are age under 30, how many children they expected you to have. And you can see that while that's, on average, that's declined to very little from around 2.3 to 2.1, um, the the convergence on the uh, half of the half of the women expect to have two children. So there's not a lot of movement in what people would seem to want to have. So why why is fertility falling so much? So that that brings us to the next uh, slide, the next reason, which is increasing constraints on childbearing. So I'm I'm going to point to a few of them: higher costs of housing, which I will pursue. In a, in a moment more de in depth, more partnership dissolution. So as, as more, particularly in the U, in Northern Europe, women enter, don't enter marriage right away. They enter cohabiting co unions, which break up a lot. So every time they break up, you have another period where the risk of childbearing is lower. Uh, also higher unemployment and lower and unstable earnings for people in their twenties in many European countries. And a higher cost of parents' time and of child care as uh, women's wages have uh, increased uh, relative to men's. And the final, so and the final thing might just this might be just another postponement in motherhood, perhaps to recover later. And if you recall from figure in the first figure, we've had these recoveries before. The example being from '95 to 2010 when there was a large increase in the in the total fertility rate. Next slide, please. So what what are these common influences that I referred to across many European countries and social groups? Well one one might be higher housing costs for young people. Now there's higher rents and house prices. So the process of leaving the parental home, entering partnerships, having children are all interlinked and they're all affected by housing costs. So, for example, there's empirical evidence in, in England and Wales that higher housing costs, higher house prices lead to people postponing leaving home and therefore postponing first partnerships and therefore 
reducing uh, rate leading to lower birth rates and a postponement of, of motherhood. Next slide, please. So this is, here, here's here's what the situation in England Wales. You can see that. So this the dash line is the total fertility rate, which is on the right hand scale, and the other two lines are the me mean and median real house price, in other words, relative to the cons other consumer prices. And you can see from 2013, there's been quite a large rise in the real uh, price of housing at the same time that fertility has been falling. Next slide, please. And this, this is not only true in England and Wales. Uh, house, real house prices increased in Belgium, in France, in the Netherlands, uh, 14% in Belgium, 11% in France, 20% in Netherlands. And in three of the Nordic countries, the real house price inflation was even larger in the 30s and 40s and 60s percent. The exception was Finland, which strangely enough had only a 2% uh, house price increase, but had, had the largest fall in fertility in the Nordic countries. So it just you know, points out that there's no magic bullet of what explains the <laughs> changes in that. Uh, in uh, fertility across the, all the countries. Next slide, please. So, so the, the final thing I'm going to mention before wrapping up is uh, what, what might this mean, say, in the context of England, Wales, where we have much more information, where I've estimated a, a statistical model of, uh, of the uh, of fertility at the individual level. And so I asked two questions. What what would the total fertility rate in 2021 have been if real house prices had remained the same as they were in 2014? And this can then be compared to the actual uh, total fertility rate in 2020. So if we go to the next slide, you can see that, so the actual rate and the rate predicted by the model in 2015 was 1.82. If real house prices had remained at the 2014 level, the fertility rate still would have fallen to 1.62. And in fact, it fell to 1.55. So that means that about uh, a quarter of the fall in the fertility rate in the UK had to do with the real house prices, but there's there were plenty the other things were operating to explain most of the decline. So even if we have a, a big factor it you know there are so many things that are you know are going on and going on commonly across europe that, that lie behind these fertility declines so a final slide i think it is so policies and fertility so i just throw these questions out to the audience do the tax and transfer policies in the country disproportionately favor older people over young people and families so pensions, pensions versus family support. Are there labor market reforms, reforms like parental leave that could make childbearing and careers more compatible? Do housing policies disproportionately favor existing owners, sort of like overly restrictive planning policies? Uh, so these are questions that all are related to are there are there actually barriers in our policy stance to uh, women having the number of children that they would like. And finally, given that there has been this decline in the fertility, what can we do to adjust better to shrinking labor forces and rising pensioner populations? For example, more education, more openness to immigration. So they, I leave you with these sort of four sort of policy related uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you, John. That was uh, very clear. And um, thank you very much for sticking to the time. Um, and that gives us the opportunity to move over to Tokyo and ask Haruka to make her presentation. Please take the floor. Thank you. All right, can you see my presentation slide? Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for giving me opportunity today. So today I speak about the situation in Japan. So as the birth rate continues to drop to record low year after year in Japan, the current Kishida administration launching the uh, extraordinary measures to cope with the declining birth rate. On the other hand, 
In order to implement truly meaningful me interventions, it is important to clarify the causes of the declining birth rate and to address the underlying issues. However, the issues still um, remain unclear. So today I'd like to discuss why the birth rate has declined so to such an extent in Japan. So why Japan's birth rate declined so much? Whenever I talk about this kind of thing, I am always told the value of the younger generation have changed. Young people do not necessarily see love and marriage as a necessity in their life, or because of the diversification of the entertainment, especially through the internet and SNS, people do not necessarily feel the need to fall in love. Or as other misunderstandings are, the number of children is declining because women are becoming more highly educated and entering into the workforce, or the poorer the household is, the more children they are. These are the, some common misunderstandings in Japan. But our research team has analyzed the data from the National Institute of Population and Social Security Research, which is under the Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare in Japan, on young people's relationship, marriage, and having children. And then based on these research findings, I'd like to show all of you how these sentences are old-fashioned in Japan. So first, the largest factor contributing to the declining birth rate in Japan is the increase in the number of unmarried people. The percentage of unmarried people at age 50 was 2.6% for men and 4.4% for women in 1998 while this figure increased to 23.37% for men and then 14.06% for women in 2015. On the right is the number of children, children born to married couples. In fact, the number of children born to married couples has consistently remained around 2.0 since about 1970. Also, a gradual, gradual declining trend can be seen in recent years, the number of children born to a married couple has still maintained the level close to 2.0. I think this is the biggest difference from the European countries, but in Japan, considering that almost all children in Japan are born to a married couple, it can be said that the largest factor behind the declining birth rate in Japan is the increase in the number of unmarried people. Now, I like to see the who these growing number of unmarried people are. These figures are from another survey and show the percentage of men and women between the ages of 18 and 39 who are unmarried and not in a relationship. In 1992, 40.3% of men and then 27.4% of women were unmarried and not in a relationship. While in 2015, 50.8% of men and then 40.7% of women were unmarried and not in a relationship. The graph on the right shows the percentage of each age group in the following categories, married, second one is never married but in a relationship, including the cohabitation and de facto marriage, and then category three is no partner but interested in a relationship, and category four is no partner and no interest in a relationship. The upper dark green indicates those who are not in a relationship and are not interested in the dating. And about 20% of men in particular are not in a relationship and are not interested in a relationship in Japan. Furthermore, we found that majority of this growing number of people who are neither dating nor interested in dating are men who are in unstable employment and have low incomes. The table below here shows the percentage by annual income and relationship status. The leftmost group, the married group, shows that 6% of the respondents have an annual income of less than 1 million yen, while 5.0% have annual income of less than 8 million yen, indicating that those in the 3 to 4.99 million and 5 to 7.99 million are in the volume zone. On the other hand, Nearly half of the respondents on the right side who answered that they have no dating partner and have no interest in dating are those with annual income of less than 1 million yen. Also, only 0.8% of the respondents have an annual income of 8 million yen or more in this category, indicating that those with annual income between 0 and 3 million yen are in the volume zone. 
In other words, the number of unmarried people is increasing, and the majority of the increased number of unmarried people are those who have no dating partner and no and are not interested in dating. But we know that the majority of those people have annual income of less than 3 million yen. A similar trend is observed in terms of the employment status, with the majority of those who have no dating partner and then are not interested in dating being unemployed or in unstable employment situation. Employment status and income have also been found to be related to the experience of having a sexual intercourse with the opposite sex. This table shows that percentage of men and women who have never had sexual intercourse with the opposite sex as of 2015, with 12.7% of men and 11.9% of women in their early 30s, indicating that they have never had sexual intercourse with the opposite sex in their lifetime. The percentage of respondents who have never had sexual intercourse with opposite sex is also clearly related to the employment status and income. In other words, the lower the income, the higher the percentage of men who have never had sexual intercourse with the opposite sex. Compared to the full-time employees, the percentage of respondents who have never had sexual intercourse with the opposite sex is also higher among unemployed and non-regular employees. Next, I'd like to look into the marriage market in Japan. Of particular interest is the bottom line, which shows the percentage of men and women who are married by annual income. Red indicates those who are married. Yellow indicated those who are unmarried but intended to get married. And then blue indicates those who are unmarried and have no intention of getting married. First for men, you can see that the percentage of men in blue decreases and the percentage of men in red increases as their income increases, especially for the 25 to 39 age group in the middle and the 40 to 49 age group on the right. Similarly, when we look at women, you can see a U shape in the case of women. In other words, for women, the lower income group and the higher income group are married. The low income group includes not only those who were housewives from the beginning of the marriage, but also those who left the workforce upon marriage or childbirth, and those who were on maternity leave and temporarily have no income. But in any case in Japan, women with higher incomes are no, now more marrying, now marrying more in Japan. And then this question asks respondents whether they intended to get married in their lifetime in Japan. Despite various comments about the diversification of entertainment among the younger generation, in reality, from 1987 to 2015, almost 90% of both men and women consistently answered that they had the intention to get married in their lifetime. What we can see from this is that the problem lies on the side of the society, which has failed to provide an environment in which people who are willing to get married cannot do so for whatever reasons. Okay, this... These disparities in income and employment also affect the number of children. The percentage of childlessness increased from 14.3% for men and then 11.6% for women in the group born between 1943 to 1947 to 39.9% for men and then 27.6% for women in the group born between 1971 and 1975. The figure on the right side shows the percentage of respondents with zero, one, two, and three or more children by annual income category. The different colored vertical bar indicates the generation of births. The leftmost black bar indicates births between 1943 to 1947, and the lightmost white bar indicates births between 1971 and 1975. First on the left is the percentage of child children with zero. Visually, we can see that the percentage of children with zero is higher for all generations in the group with annual income from zero to less than three million. On the other hand, the bottom one is for those with annual income over 60 million yen, and we can see that the percentage of zero children is lower than that of the top two groups. And then the, this figure is the showing the relationship between education status and the fatality among the women. The figure on the right shows that the total fatality rate on the vertical axis and the age at which women were born on the horizontal axis. 
From 1943 to 1970, women with less than a college degree indicated by the dotted line had a higher birth rate than those with a college degree indicated by the straight line. However, the most recent comparison for women born between 1971 and 1975 shows that the straight line and the dotted line overlap. It means we now already know that women's education does not correlate with the number of children anymore in Japan. So finally, this is the uh, recent sexual activity in Japan. So sexual inactivity in the common trend, not only in Japan, but also in other high income countries. But the figure for sexual inactivity in Japan are much higher than in other high income countries. Although the fatality rate declined temporarily in all countries after the COVID-19, the fatality rate in European countries showing the sign of recovery, while in Japan there are no sign of recovery, Unless we pay attention to the reality of the sexual inactivity and the deep social and economic factors involved in the building relationship with other opposite sex, the birth rate will not improve dramatically, no, mat no matter what measures are taken to the combat the declining birth rate. So in conclusion, the declining birth rate and the underlying increase in the number of unmarried people in Japan are not primarily due to the changes in the values of the younger generation. Rather, the real reason is that they were the victim of the ice age or jobless generation and the stagnating society. The younger generation should not be considered the cause of the declining birth rate, but rather they are the victim of the stagnant society, and it is necessary to change the social structure rather than attributing the cause of the declining birth rate to individual responsibility, such as the changing values. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, that was a very rich presentation, um, during which I thought of all sorts of questions to ask. Uh, in addition, I, I, I must tell the audience, I, I had the pleasure of looking at the presentations beforehand. But um, your, the way you presented uh, raised all sorts of other questions uh, in my brain. So, um, but, but let's start the discussion uh, with, with John. Um, <clears throat> Obviously, um, the recent Japanese measures uh, increased support uh, for family allowance, a new child and family agency, uh, a strong focus on uh, supporting uh, families uh, in, in a financial manner. Um, and make it very clear that in Japan, um, the fertility trends are a major driver of policy development. Um, but you don't hear so much about that in, in Europe. What what's what what is your thinking about that, uh, John? Well, I think the, there's a there's a large there's great diversity in Europe. So I mean, I, I would put on one end we have Hungary, <laughs> uh, which I didn't mention in in the presentation, but I mean they've made yeah, well, particularly since two thousand and and after the new after Viktor Orban became prime minister again in 2010. Large, I mean, really huge scale investment in family allowances, supporting families. Uh, uh, I mean, I can mention some of the details if you like, but uh, so, so that's on, on one end of things. Now, and on the, you know, there is some evidence that that might have increased the, the fertility rate uh, a bit, particularly for the first group of measures in the 2000s. But if you look at the last 10 years, when there was even, even more uh, pronatalist measures instituted, and you compare the fertility rate in um, Germany and the fertility rate in Hungary, they've moved more or less in parallel. And in fact, the fertility rate in Hungary is still, until the last year, 2020, that's available, all that time they were below the German rate. So I mean, the Germans have done much less in this regard, and yet they end up with the same fertility rate. I mean, it's this is a very, it's not really a proper policy analysis, but I mean, if you are spending that sort of money, uh, and uh, yeah, which is costing the rest of the population quite a lot, you must wonder how efficient is this? I mean, how, to what extent are we just giving money to people who are going to have that many children anyway. So I mean, there's probably is some effect at the margin, but yeah, I think a society has to ask how much you want to devote resources on families to uh, uh, from the rest of the population. 
So that's on one. That's so that's Hungary's one end of the scale. The other end of the scale is the UK. I would think that who uh, don't talk about this at all. They, yeah, they, they don't. There's no policies which are in, uh, which have been discussed because of the low fertility. Uh, they, so the, the the general view here is that low fertility. Okay, we have we might have to do some other things. Uh, you know, just pensions and retirement age and so forth. But we're not. Yeah, there's no talk of actually. Uh, changing policies toward uh, encouraging fertility. And I think this is true in a lot of Northwestern European countries. Thank you, John. Yeah, uh, that's what, what we found. I mean, there are some some concerns in um, Nordic countries in particular, but um, that does not necessarily mean that that leads to policy action. Then again, uh, we, we released a study on Norway in June they do everything right in terms of policy and in, in terms of supporting families. They really, compared to many other countries, have no issues on the labor market. Uh, and still, their fertility rates are falling. Um, that points us to, to the issue that uh, Aruka raised in her uh, presentation. Um, attitudes are playing a role. Uh, younger generations have different attitudes than, than older generations. Um, in your presentation, you, you made it quite clear that um, particularly low-income men have difficulty partnering. Um, and I was wondering whether low-income women had the same issue, but you, you don't think so, whereas, which confused me because when it comes to having sex, it's men, men and women abstain in the same, uh, to the same extent. Uh, the same thing with but so I was a bit wondering about it. Can you tell us a bit more about the, the change in attitudes among younger people and why particularly men are at risk of staying on the shelf? Let, let's put it like that. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. And it, it is, of course, true that the values in the younger generation changed a lot compared to the older generation. So the, in 1980s or 1990s or even early 2000, the typical formation of the marriage in Japan is that only men work outside of the home and then women stay at home and taking care of all kinds of the housekeeping issues, like including child care or care for the older adults. But as I said, now it's younger generation started to consider this kind of family formation is a risk in the future generation. Because of the stagnated economy or lower income in the younger generation, and the younger people started to consider that not only only male working and then women stay at home, but changing the both men and women working outside of the home and then doing the child care together, men and women. So what's happened in the younger generation is that not only women, but men also prefer the higher income and highly educated women as a dating partner or even the marriage partner. But this trend is particularly obvious in the younger generation, like the 20s and early 30s, and then it is very different in those who are older age, I mean, the 50s and the 60s. John, is there anything similar going on in, in, in Europe? or you're, you're muted, John. You have to unmute yourself. Yeah, sorry. Uh... And well, as I say, there's a lot of diversity. I, I, I don't. I mean, I don't think there's, yeah, you know, there, there's not this. Well, for one thing, it's not the issue of who marries and who doesn't marry. I mean, there's uh, a lot of childbearing. So in, in Britain, half half the childbearing goes on outside marriage. Uh, I mean, and I, I mean, I was quite struck by the number of you know, in in Haruka's presentation, the number of uh, uh, young people who have no interest in having a, a, a partner, uh, which see, which also, but also that seemed to contradict something that occurred later in that most people wanted to have a family, they wanted to marry and have a family. Uh, so there, I mean, so I think this is one of those constraints that are that a barrier which is somehow blocking these people from you know doing what they 
they'd like. But I mean, I, I, the, the, the issues as presented in the Japanese context, I think, are quite different from uh, the European countries that I'm familiar with. Uh, 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 Uruka, coming coming back to you on on just that point. I mean, um, fertility is strongly associated with with marriage in Japan, and you made it quite clear that a large driver of the fall in uh, fertility uh, was the growing group of of unmarried uh, people. But what about uh, the fertility within couples that are married? Is that going down too? Are we talking about these these families still having two children or only one? Uh, are, the larger families do they still exist in Japan? What what what's going on within married couples? Okay, so the, compared to the nineteen seventies, the fertility rate among the married couple is almost stable, and even now the fertility rate among the married couple is almost a 2.0, slightly less than the 2.0 recently, but almost keeping a 2.0 in the past 40 years. Okay, well, that, yeah. that's no that's a pre pretty pretty clear answer. Um, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll come back to the attitudes in, in, in a minute, um, but I want to, to touch upon uh, a couple of things uh, John said in his um uh, presentation about barriers and the cost of families. Um, John, you make it very clear that in England, Wales at least, uh, housing costs are uh, uh, a main barrier to fertility. Um, how does that play out uh, in, in the rest of Europe? Um, you, you mentioned some numbers for Belgium and, and the Netherlands, but um, what other costs might, might uh, impose a barrier? I mean, I can think of childcare costs. Uh, the UK has a system of private education. Um, are there any other costs that families uh, in, in Europe uh, might face? Yes, well, well the child, child care is a, is a major, you know, when a major item in, in most countries. I mean, it's certainly not a major item in the UK. I mean, and uh, it's, uh, you know, in this, in, in this, there's certainly much, even more discussion about it in the past uh, five, five, ten years, uh, because it's not, it's, it's not, it's, well, I wouldn't call it a system at all. It's, it's just it's sort of, you know, everybody, everybody for themselves, and uh, it's, uh, and I mean, the, in, uh, it, it's certainly been an issue in a lot of European countries. A lot of European countries have done things about. They, they've improved the 12 care system and we know uh i mean in scandinavia i mean there's uh uh you know a mu much more support for children in that way um yeah we also see they still they still have quite low fertility you mentioned the you mentioned norway um i mean i, I think in that, you know another another barrier is that is the in which i think is probably not I may be wrong. I'm not such an issue in Japan. Is the is the rate of partnership dissolution? Uh, I mean, you, you know, for people who are entering, who are having unions, is most in their first partnership. Most, the majority of those are going to break up, even the ones with children. So I mean, that that means that you then have a period until you find another partner where you're not going to be bearing more children, or you're not going to start be starting a family. And uh, I think I think this is you know, this is all this is an issue across all of Northern Europe in, in the Nordic countries, uh, uh, all the places which have high levels of cohabitation, um, and e even in Southern Europe now, Spain and Portugal, uh, Spain and Portugal and Italy also have very high rates of cohabitation, which are, which are, are not are not stable. The, the countries vary about how much childbearing goes on in in these, these cohabiting unions, but more and more of those countries are having childbearing within these unions as well, including in Southern Europe. So, you know, so the, you know, the, this uncertainty throughout people's lives of how long they're going to stay together, uh, not only leads people to postpone starting, but if they, if they actually break up, then there's a period where they're not going to be you know, adding to their family. Right, we're we're getting close to our um, 
uh, uh, the the, um, the 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 a lot of time we have for our discussion, but there's there's two questions I want to raise, and I know uh, Ruka, you had your hand up, so you can uh, come back to to John first if you want to, please. Go okay. for it. Yeah, uh, you had your hand uh, up, so yeah, you wanted yeah, to make just, an intervention. Yeah, I just would like to add the situation about the cost of the child care in Japan. So, of course, in Japan, the same as the uh, housing cost is a major problem, especially in the Tokyo areas, like some Asian countries like Tokyo, Seoul, uh, Hong Kong, Beijing, Shanghai, these big cities in Asian regions, housing cost is extremely high and then it is a huge burden, especially on the younger generation. And then education cost is same. And it is a huge problem for the younger generation. And then another major factor is a decrease in the income due to women taking leaves of absence or being forced to work shorter hours temporarily. So since Japan, in Japan, long working hours are still the norm in Japan. So even after the childbirth, especially for male, stay at the office very long time. So only, only women forced to take the shorter working hours or temporarily leave from the labor market, which causes the decrease in the household income. So in Japan, which is also seen as the cost of the child care. I think this is the work, long working hours and then women forced to work short hours is this kind of the Japanese typical situation. Thank you. Well, you 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 made the the clear bridge to the point I was going to raise: the role of the labour market. Um, Japan, long working hours, um, socialising with colleagues after work, uh, long commutes. Um, you don't see your wife very often uh, if you're a male worker, and the same applies for for the female worker. Even though, on average, she may have some shorter um, working hours. Um, what could employers do to uh, make a contribution to improving the, the, the family life of their employees. Okay, so in Japan, so I think the labor market has not too low. One is the, just I mentioned in my presentation today, the, I think the root cause in Japan is the unstable employment and the lower wage salary is a major cause of the unmarried, especially for the younger generation. So I think the private company or labor market should have or uh, should promote an effort to improve the working environment. I mean the uh provide a stable opportunity, stable working opportunity or increasing the salary for especially for the younger generation. So that younger generation can have the opportunity to get married. This is the one. And then another law is just I mentioned that long working hour is the another problem in Japanese uh, working environment. So the uh, once I think the uh, during the COVID nineteen, many Japanese company introduced the flex work, remote work, or work from home. But now some major big companies are trying to go back to the before the COVID nineteen, which force the employees to come to the physically come to the office every day and stay at the office or the very late night. So I think the changing the working environment, especially for the long working hour and does not care what effectiveness of the work style is should be changed. So I think this is the two major law for the labor market. Okay, well, John, um, uh, how does that work for the UK? I mean, I, I'm Dutch. I, I think that um... Uh, Dutch employers are generally more tolerant also after COVID of their workers working from home. I think sort of similar flexible approach uh, prevails in, in, in the UK, whereas uh, many of my colleagues in France are happily or unhappily, but they are going back to the office. Uh, their bosses want to see them. Um, ha uh, does, does the labor market impose important barriers to fertility trends in the UK or not? Well, I think I think it it interacts with the um, the housing cost and the childcare. Um, I mean, it's so if you if if you if you need two income. I mean, so for example, home ownership is still a great goal in the UK. Um, just like family size, it's not being attained <laughs> for for similar reasons that the. You know, you you need two incomes. Uh, so uh, unless you're in, um, both parents are in quite high earning jobs, um, they the childcare 
makes it very difficult for them to uh, start um, start childbearing. And uh, so, there, I mean, there's been, yeah, post-COVID, there's much more flexi time working and so forth. But, uh, you know, it's, it's not clear whether that really, whether, uh, clear that, whether that helps that much, because, I mean, many people working flexi time at home are working more hours now than they ever did. So, you, you, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't square the, the, the circle for in terms of childcare. So I think it's it's the the interaction of yeah you know, inter, the interaction of, of these various constraints which uh, which uh, you know, were you know, are sort of represent sort of bar barriers to childbearing and it's it's something that you know, is, is is the intensity of this is relatively new I mean particularly the housing market situation. Okay, my final question, and I would like to alert the the audience. I mean, please please think about your questions uh, to be put to to John and Aruka in a minute. Um, but my final question, particularly for uh, Aruka, is: Well, you know, if people don't want to have sex anymore, uh, what can governments do? And John, for you, um, what could the British government do? Uh, to improve things in, in, in the UK. But Aruka, you first, please. Okay, thank you very much. I think this is also a huge debate in Japan because I think the to having a sex or to having a dating partner or even get married is, of course, the I think this is kind of an individual human rights. And then, of course, government cannot do anything about the individual choice, right? Uh, but the our research shows that those who are, especially for the men, those who are high income and then those who are graduated from the university degree, in that case, very few men answer that they are no interest in having sexual intercourse. And then only those who are lower income or unstable employment or jobless people say that they are no interest in having sex. So which means, I think in reality is that they probably have some interest to having a dating partner or having a sexual intercourse with an opposite sex, but they are less confident to saying that I'm interested in having a dating partner or having a sexual intercourse. So that's why they are answered to the questionnaire that no interest in the such intercourses. So the I think the uh, government cannot, of course, cannot do anything about the choice of having a sexual intercourse or having a dating partner, but probably should address an underlying cause why only lower income male answered they are not interested in having sexual intercourse. Thank you very much, John. Well, I mean, I, I, th I think there's a, there's quite a, there's, I, I think I would turn it around a bit like this than that. I, there are many policies which I think would be welfare enhancing for a large group in any case related to, uh, say, longer parental leaves, um, more flexible working, uh, you know, better arrangements for childcare, which even if they didn't affect fertility at all, would be probably a lot of people would be better off. And uh, and I think at the same time they would sort of uh, reduce some of the the barriers for people starting a family. So uh, I, I I yeah, my general thing is tr trying to remove the barriers because most of those barriers are making people, a lot of people worse off as it is. Thank you, John. Thank you, Ruka, for your availability. I would like to thank the Daiwa Foundation, actually, for organizing this webinar, because I, I really enjoyed myself. And I uh, hope that uh, many of the listeners did so, too. And I hand it back to whoever uh, of the Daiwa Secretariat uh, was supposed to end this, uh, this uh, webinar. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Kevin.